Risk taking um, is a form of flexibility. You plan to do the expedition with minimum risks. In the case of exploration to break world records, which has been my business for 40 years, breaking records means doing it before anybody else. And pretty much every polar expedition we've gone for has had world polar experts trying to break that record and failing. And therefore, we know that we've got to think flexibly and we know that we must avoid risks because any risk that you take adds to the chances of failure. So plan, look at the risks that other people have taken and don't go for them, avoid them. Skirt the risks, don't try to work out a way of going over them. Minimal risk taking is what we go for. I reckon that uh, a definition of leadership is the ability to do what the aim consists of, whether it's to go to the North Pole, or to go to the North Pole before anybody else does, or to go to the North Pole with scientists gathering information en route. So that whatever um, ancillary aims are attached to the main aim, the leader is coping with every aspect of the expedition and keeping the various people happy as much as is possible, not appearing to be too dictatorial unless that leader has the confidence of being better than anybody else on that team at making a decision. So if there was a crevasse field got in the way and you wake up in the morning and you look out of the tent and you see that the crevasse field is difficult, but you know you are the best person in the world at knowing how to cross crevasse fields, which is not a skill that helps you get a job anywhere in the world, but in this particular leadership situation, you have the confidence to say, we will cross the crevasse field on the left-hand side. If you know when you wake up that that crevasse field is going to be equally easy wherever, you don't be dictatorial. You put it to everybody in the team, which way shall we cross this crevasse field? Knowing that we, whatever they come up with is going to be okay. So be a dictatorial leader when you have to be to affect the outcome due to your self-confidence. With some fear that a person who's trying to do some accomplishment knows that they have got, in my particular case, uh, climbing a big mountain when I know that I've got vertigo, you have to try and find the world's expert climber, uh, mountain guide or whatever it is, and rely on them knowing that they have previously taken vertigo people up dreadful mountains because they have developed a method of advising that vertigo victim how to get over their phobia during a difficult climb. And shall we say, in the case of vertigo, it's very simple. You do not look down. And if you have a, a guide who's up on the end of the rope, uh, either just above you or just below you, um, uh, who sees that you are beginning to look down and will scream at you. But the worst of all is when your brain starts thinking down, even though you're looking up, and starts imagining the, the dark void below. And strange things like a bird flying around just below your feet on a 6,000 foot drop makes you start thinking of that dreadful void and once the vertigo rush comes on you, it has effects like making you go weak at a time when you're on little grips you don't want you to be, be weak. You have to avoid that rush beginning to come. And the only way of doing that is to maintain on the Eiger, the north face of the Eiger, it was three days and nights that I had to control my brain with the help of uh, Kenton Cool, who's been up Everest 11 times, um, knowing my weakness and constantly watching it and controlling my mind, basically. That was the key. Find somebody better than you, the best person at that particular project, and listen to everything they say to guard you from your own weakness.
People have succeeded amazingly um, without failures en route, um, largely because not just the skills they have developed to a fine art, higher than anyone before them, but also because of their luck quotient. People don't like talking about luck because it takes away from their ability, but luck is vastly important. And many of the failures that we have had has been to bad luck, although you can't say so because they say it's, you know, you're trying to get out of it. And many of our successes have been due to an amazing good luck. When you try and translate expeditions into business parallels, it is sometimes an artificial business. It should be obvious when you do a lecture on the expeditions, how you raise the money for the expeditions by persuading business that it was in their interests. They would get wonderful photographs of their logo in strange things. The fact that we raise huge sums of money, nearly 20 million pounds from the expeditions for the charities that we choose, helps because it means that the big business is actually involved in, in money raising as well as getting PR for themselves. When it comes to saying the leadership, the problems with the team, how do you push that into the business? It, it's very obvious. I don't have to lecture and say that equals that. The people who are listening will see the problems that we've had, the difficulty of mounting an expedition. I mean, one expedition that wife and I planned, we worked every day for seven years unpaid, working at weekends in pubs to make a living in order to follow one particular aim. That could have been a business aim. In our case, it was to break a big world record, but it took an awful lot of time. We needed 29 million pounds in the early, nine, in the early 70s and that ended up with 1,900 sponsor companies. That's a lot of work, and you have to pay them all back PR-wise. But as you lecture on it, the business people listening will draw their own conclusions. You don't sort of sit there like a school nanny. Winners are people who A, had good luck on their side, B, not too much bad luck on their side, C, they do it slowly but surely because they're probably not born a natural winner in that particular field. So they gradually gain the confidence and the ability and the way of passing it on to the new people if they do need new people in their team. One of the successes is keeping your team very small. If you're doing physical things, it's better to have um, 10 people who've got 20 legs that might be broken rather than 40 people who've got 80 legs that might be broken if one broken leg will stop the entire project. Because our group um, really went for polar, rather than mountains or oceans or deserts. We developed over 40 years a greater skill than all our rivals, with one exception, which is the Norwegians. They are extremely good. Possibly they have more ice and snow in their back gardens geographically than we do in the UK. Possibly they have a history of breaking world records above the Brits. But we have gained many world polar records over 40 years, which they've been going for, but we've beaten them to it, and the other way around as well. So in that particular field, I think we've done as well as we possibly could do. To set back from failure, you just try again. So when we tried to go up Everest um, and failed, on the Tibetan side of Everest, there's two sides to go up Everest. I just thought, well, I'll try the other side, you know, i.e. I be flexible. When I failed on that side also, I looked at the two failures and I said, what went wrong? So a year later, I tried again from the easiest side of the two, having learnt the lessons of failure previously. And on the third time, I got to the top without any problem at all and wondered why it had been so difficult on the previous two times. And that sort of parallel applies to other expeditions as well. First of all, before you set out, you, you know why other people failed. The second time after a failure, you know why other people and you failed. And the third time, if you don't do it then, you're never going to do it.